Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. So, oh, hey, Nigel. Uh, oh, hey, Veronica. Oh, from Pittsburgh. I hope it's not too early. So today we're having another one of our guest speaker sessions, and this is focused around the Class Central. Oh, it says Class Central somewhere. Uh, free Web Development Boot Camp. Oh, hello. But this is accessible and should be really interesting for everybody. I am, you know, always excited, but I'm exceptionally excited today because we've got somebody who's just so interesting and somebody who's going to talk to us about something we can do with our technical skills that not that web development isn't fancy and not that not that web design or or going into other technical things aren't life affirming and soul enriching but it's going to talk to us about the really ability to get weird with programming for those of you who are in the boot camp remember that when we don't know what we're doing say like, oh this is a new concept or oh i don't know what this is our three options are to ask someone the most boring option to look it up most technically correct option, or the most enjoyable option is to get weird. And we're going to be joined by Antonio Roberts, who really is going to answer the question, what if you took this get weird option and you made that your whole career? What would it look like if you got weird professionally? And I'm going to let him introduce himself because he's going to do a much better job than I will. Antonio, Hello. what's it like to be professionally weird? Oh, it's amazing. Um, that word introduction was just great. Being weird for a career. I, I love it because it rhymes and it describes the last 10 to 15 years of my life. <laughs> so, yeah, it's and, great. Antonio, you're very British. British people don't brag at all ever, but I'm, I'm going to force you out of that. <laughs> Antonio, what is the coolest? Look, you're, you're, what do you do? What 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 is the coolest thing you've gotten to do recently? I mean, it's twenty twenties. Like we we've gotten yeah, to yeah. go outside. Um, yeah. How about instead of me just eagerly asking you questions, how about I go ahead and give you some space to introduce yourself, to introduce your work, because you're going to be talking to us about art and programming. Yes. So I'm very really... precise, clean lines, very formal design. Uh. Colors. There'll be lots of colors. <laughs> you like those, so yeah. But I, I can I can do a bit of an introduction, and then of course I'm going to have some like slides and a bit of demonstration. But um, yeah. But again, thank that was that was a really good introduction. Uh, weird for a career. That's my new tagline. Um, um, so, for those of you who are following along, if you want to cheer Antonio on, you can yell nicely, yell at him at any point during this presentation. But we're going to go ahead and save our questions to the end if that's not a bother. So you can ask him, but just make sure to ask him again at the end. Otherwise, I'm an old lady. I'll forget them. Yeah. Um, Antonio, yeah. I'm going to bow out. Shall I add your shall I add your incredible visuals as you introduce yourself? Uh, not not yet. Um if I could give you um I'll uh, give just you, give me I'll a little you. flourish. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, cool. So um hi everybody. Um, I'm actually doing a boot camp as well. Um, you know, even though I've been doing I guess programming for a while now, there's always new skills to learn. So uh I'm I'm always looking for opportunities to do that. So yes, um, hi everyone. Uh, as Jess said, my name is Antonio Roberts and I'm an artist and curator. Um, that is one who organizes um, exhibitions uh, and I'm based in Birmingham in the UK. And yeah, I've been making d digital art for um, most of my adult life, but I guess professionally, uh, you know, making it for like profit, um, exhibiting spaces and everything. I've been doing that for probably around 12-ish years. And what I wanted to do today is just kind of show you what it is. Um, <laughs> Birmingham is a cool place in the city, in the, in the UK. Sorry, thank you, Jess, for that fact. But yeah, what I want to kind of show you today is um, how I use programming to get a bit weird, to, to use it, to use programming to make some sort of art and of course art is subjective but you know i this the art that i make it gets shown in galleries and there's a community of people who like it so hopefully <laughs> that passes the qualification of what is art and what isn't art so um i'll be talking for about 20 minutes or maybe 30 who knows we'll see but um of course ask questions there's going to probably be a lot of new concepts and i'll try and explain them 
as best as I can. And of course, yeah, uh, as Jess said, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat and I'll try and ask them, um, answer them um, as best I can either during the talk or at the end. But yeah, so if you uh, would like to put up my um, slides, Jess, and I'll begin. Oh, such a smooth transition. I love it when things work. So, <laughs> which is definitely not something that usually happens when I'm making artwork. So yeah, cool. So my website and my username generally is Hello Cat Food because you know, cats are the best. And you can find my website, hellocatfood.com. It doesn't look quite like that right now. It's mostly just a blog at the moment, but you know, it's all very colorful. So um, yeah, and you, I have a lot of projects that I've made and I will, I shall be, um, oh, yeah. So I shall be you know, taking you a few, uh, through a few of those. And okay, I guess uh, just to clarify as well, let's let's leave questions till the end. Just write them down and um, save them, but be be enthusiastic about asking them at the end. Okay, so um, yes, yeah, so if you want to go to our website, you can hellocatfood.com. And I guess if you ever think about people who make digital art, um, if you haven't experienced it, you might think you see things like this. And these are some examples of my artwork. Like this is a still image from a um, little ident I did for a, um, a for MTV. See, that's me bragging <laughs> as little as I brag as I can um, from like 2016. And this is, you know, this is composed in fairly normal ways that you would consider making digital art. Uh, another screenshot from a music video I made here. Um, again, a couple, couple more screenshots. And yeah, this is, if you ever, if anyone here is, um, I guess like has done any sort of graphic design before, you may be familiar with programs like, you know, Adobe Photoshop or Illustrator, or if you like using open source software, like I do, uh, you might have used Inkscape uh, or Blender. And so the, these artworks, that, these screenshots that you're looking at right now, these are made using those sorts of methods, uh, very sort of um, familiar methods. And you're using a graphical user interface or a GUI. So you know, you're, you're clicking on buttons and moving your mouse around. And as I said, some of my artwork is animations. And I'll just play a little bit of one of the animations for you. Let's see how smoothly I can do this. Uh, not smooth at all. <laughs> so yeah, so and like my animations, when like the pictures that you just saw were stills from animations, and when you look at my animations, it tends to look a little bit like this. You know, very colorful, very kind of abstract. Um, and this one is just like a loop that will go on forever and ever and ever. And uh, yeah, so when I'm making my artwork, it looks a bit like this, um, using, as I said. Uh, software which uh, you might be familiar with like so this is just a uh, a screenshot from the interface of the background of in fact that artwork that you just saw so this is blender which is a 3d modeling software and definitely i know there's people here learning programming so <laughs> i wouldn't expect you all to know how to do 3d modeling that is a yeah a career in itself to learn you could spend your whole life learning that but yeah so yeah, i'm making my artwork sometimes using graphical user interfaces, which are still very complicated, but it's you just clicking buttons and things. But then um, on another side of things, um, I'm also using programming to make some of my artwork. So like this image here, um, yeah, trippy, thank you. <laughs> so uh, like this image here was made using, uh, believe it or not, using programming, which sometimes looks a little bit like this. Um, this is uh, this is a little script which generates basically like very fluid looking GIFs or animated GIFs even, um, little animations. And the language being used here is something called Bash. So if anyone's familiar with the terminal in uh, like Mac or Linux, this might be a familiar language. And all I'm doing really is just kind of like defining colors and uh, using some random numbers to pick a different color each time, and then uh, creating shapes. And similarly here as well, um, a lot of comments <laughs> because um, on on how the code works, so I can come back to it. And that sort of code. Um, oh, and also there's sometimes you can use this programming to make music as well, which I'll demonstrate. I'll show you at some point soon. Um, 
And yeah, the, the code that you just saw beforehand, those two screens, makes things that look a little bit like this. So these are just like two uh, fluid animations that were made using just that code. And the code as I wrote it is that when every time I launch the code, every time I run it, it will generate a new one of these animations each time. So here's another couple one. And yeah, these are just like, I make the, this one I made just for fun, you know, there was no uh, conceptual basis for it really. It was like, I want to make something that looks a little bit wavy and a little bit trippy. Um, and yeah, that was, the, that was the remit for it really. Um, and similarly, this one, uh, I'm sure you've all experienced low quality JPEGs before or glitches on your computer, but I made this animated GIF to make it look like it's a it's a glitch being generated in front of you. So again, it's not necessarily, um, there wasn't like a big concept behind it, but using programming, you can make these really, I guess, as a, as a uh, yeah, or kind of organic behavior, you're using random numbers to um, generate this visual imagery. And moving on a little bit, this is, you can also, it doesn't always look so, um, I guess, actually this does look abstract. <laughs> what am I talking about? I was gonna say, it doesn't always look abstract, but then I showed you a completely abstract image. So this, for example, is a, a screenshot from an animation that I made in 2004 for, uh, sorry, 2014 for the Tate galleries and um, another sc screenshot from it as well. Um, I'll try and play a part of the video from it as well. So this this is a very trippy, this one. Hopefully you can actually see it because I know that compression um, likes to uh, take, have its way with this artwork because there's lots of colors. So I know there's lot, I won't play this too long because some people get headaches watching it actually, <laughs> um, funnily enough. So yeah, and sometimes, so yeah, sometimes it looks a bit like that. And then, um, and a similar artwork which I made was um, this artwork. It actually started off as a piece of text and sort of like what the previous commenter said, it, like it distorted itself in a very organic looking way. And I'll just play that piece. It's only like um, 40 seconds long and it starts off with a piece of text. If anyone's familiar with the artist Alvin Lucio, it's a remix of one of his artworks. But if not, that's OK. Don't worry. Um, but it starts off with a piece of text that um, is legible and then over the course of like 30 seconds it just becomes more and more legible. So I'll just play that for you quickly. It's, it's a, again, it's a short video. So let's have a quick look. And it is silent. Um, so actually, you know, I'll talk over it a bit because <laughs> having silence is always terrible. So yeah, you can see now it's starting to glitch a bit and it's just getting more and more distorted. To the point where it just fills the screen and it's completely illegible. And that particular artwork was shown, has been shown at you know, quite a few different galleries. And just like the other artworks um, that are some of the other artworks that I showed you, it was made using just programming. Uh, you have the text and then you add bits of code to generate random numbers, which will randomize the position of the letters and the shapes that make up the letters. So yeah, that's like some of the artworks that I've made using programming. But a thing which I've been doing a lot more recently um, is something called live coding. Um, oops, sorry, something called live coding. And what live coding is, is kind of what it suggests really <laughs> in, in the words. So imagine all of that code, which I showed you earlier. Uh, so, but instead of, so like, yeah, ima imagine all of this, um, but instead of me like writing the code um, and then running it and then you seeing the results uh, like a later stage, you know, I'm there in an office typing away. But you so with live coding, what I'm doing is I'm doing all of this live in front of an audience and I, you know, people are watching and in live coding performances, people are using code to make um, sort of audio and visual. So, you know, if you've gone to a club and you listen to dance music, people are making these, um, some will be some in these uh, things will be making um, visuals on a projector and uh, music using just programming. Um, and the way, and they do this at 
events called Algo Raves. <laughs> um, I love talking about Algo Raves. Uh, so yeah, Algo Raves is a portmanteau, you know, a combination of two words, algorithm and rave. And it is as, as nerdy as it sounds, but it's also awesome. But I am biased in saying that, but it is awesome. <laughs> and it looks a little bit, uh, when you go to an Algo Rave, these happen all over the world. But, you know, you have people kind of like, you know, at their computers programming, but the difference is that, as in this image, for example, you can see the code that we're typing as we're typing it, um, which, of course, is very, very nerve wracking. You've got like an audience of people watching you um, type, and they can see all the mistakes that you're making. But in a way, sometimes that's OK. People want to see that the computer isn't just something that uh, is like an automatic robot. They want to see a human uh, typing. And uh, yeah, and sometimes the mistakes that happen generate some nice little accidents. So yeah, these are just like photos of the people like Plogo doing stuff at algorithms. And these events have happened all over the world. Like I remember I was in uh, I was in Texas uh, for South by Southwest in 2019 doing one of these algorithms. And for other people in, in the UK, um, you might know this building. This is the British Library. So yeah, having an array, a rave in a library of all places. But yep, that's what we did. Uh, and no one told us to be quiet, which uh, I thought was amazing. Um, yeah, so again, these are people programming, making music. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of um, examples of what this sounds like. So I need to stop sharing my screen and then start sharing it again, just because of the way the software works. So I'll press stop. I'll just show you a couple of examples. And, and now I need to press share again. Uh, share screen. Yep. Share a Chrome tab. And here we go. So this is just one example of, oh, wait. Uh, I actually, I think I forgot to press share audio. So um, sorry about that. Let's try one more time. Don't you love technology? It's, it's always smooth. Uh, yeah, there we go, share audio. This one's a bit quiet, but yeah. So that's one, uh, I'll share another one. Um, this one's more of a rave. This one's a bit louder as well. You'll be able to hear this a bit more. Uh, share screen. And which one is it? That one. Share audio. And press play. Um, yeah, if you like trance, dance music, that, that's your lot right there. And I'll show one more video from this algorithm stuff. And then, uh, yeah, so one more. Um, so, wait, sorry, one second. <laughs> to all, all of the tabs, all of the things. Um, there we go. I knew it was going to be somewhere. And... Oh, I forgot to press share audio again. See, technology, it's great. There. And, yeah. So um, yeah, that's just a very, very short few examples of what live coding is. Let me just get my um, slides back up as well. Um, yeah, and there's so much, like I, I could do a whole one hour presentation just on live coding in itself, but of course we don't have the time for that. Um, you don't have to show all the things. So um, yeah, like 
And live coding is, oh, if you just have this uh, slides back up on screen, please, Jess. Thank you. Yeah, so um, live coding as a thing, um, it's kind of started back in 2014. Of course, people have been making electronic music since forever, but the, the I guess the concept, the bringing together of the concept of showing your screen in a performance and showing the code in a performance started around 2014 in a place, uh, well, yeah, started in 2014 in the UK. And there's a massive community around um, live coding. Uh, yeah, wherever you are in the world, you probably might be able to find someone doing it. And yeah, in, in a performance, you'll have usually two people. You'll have one per. Um, you, you, yeah, usually uh, one person generating music using programming. So they're using uh, one uh, particular language to make the music. And another person will be using a different programming language to make the music as well. Uh, sorry, the visuals as well. So yeah, you have like a what's known as a DJ and a VJ disc jockey, visual jockey, who will be on stage making the whole experience happen for everyone. And I know that in, in this course right now, in this boot camp, we're learning um, HTML and CSS. And you know, there's so many different programming languages out there. You probably heard of Python, JavaScript, uh, Haskell, C++. Uh, oh, I, I could just, it sounds like I'm just saying just random letters, but no, these are actual programming languages. And so depending on like what kind of person you are and like what kind of programming languages you like using, there's a variety out there. There is a variety of things that you can use. This is just like a screenshot. Um, there's a website which um, I guess, um, oh, if you find me on Twitter, I can send you the link to this or I might put the link up after this talk anyway, um, of like links to places where you can learn about live coding and all of the different languages that there are. Like for example, the, what I use, oh, can I shift? Yeah, let me make the screen bigger. There we go. So, um, yes, yeah, like this is just a screenshot of the so GitHub top lap awesome live coding. Again, I can put this link somewhere, uh, at least on my Twitter um, later. But this is just like we'll show, for example, like all the different languages that there are. And this is only a, a tiny little bit of all the different languages that there are. There, are, I'm not going to say there's hundreds, but there's a lot. So if you like Python, there's going to be one for you. If, if you like using Bash, there's probably one that, you, that uses that. I don't know. Um, but there's plenty there. And all of them will do things in a different way, which might be uh, more suitable to like how you work as a person. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of a demonstration of one of the language, oops, sorry, it's got the thank you slide, ignore it, you didn't see that. <laughs> I'll do a little demonstration of one of the languages that I like to use. So um, I, when, when I've been doing my live coding uh, over the years, one I've mostly been like someone who does uh, visuals. So I'll be working with the, the DJ, well not DJ, but you know, working with the person who makes music and showing the visuals on screen and making the visuals on screen. And one of the programming languages that I use is something called Pure Data. And it's very different from what you see on the screen right now in that it's known as, it's, it's what's known as a visual programming language. So imagine like you've got a mind map. So, you know, when you've got a mind map, you'll start off with a concept in the middle and then you'll have things that branch off from it. So you'll have an idea and that branches off to another idea, and another idea. And that's sort of what visual programming languages do. So rather than typing lines uh, of text, like what, again, what you can see on screen, you'll have um, all of your functions in um, actual boxes, actual objects that um, take arguments and then you can click on them and interact with them. So let me show you an example. So here, this is, as I said, it's a program called Pure Data and it looks a little bit like this. Well, when you saw it, actually, the screen is completely blank and you can see here I've got a box and there's an actual line that um, connects both of the things. I'll make it a tiny bit bigger. Yeah, it's, uh, I might have to make it smaller at some point soon, but hopefully you can see this. And what this, and our, this is an incredibly quick uh, look at it because of course it's, a, anyway, it's another language you can learn and can take forever doing that. So um, here in this thing where it says gem win, that is like a function, um, it's an object and it's, um, and it takes arguments, and the arguments come from this. Uh, so I'm sending by clicking on this thing here. 
I'm sending the argument create and the number one to this object called gemwin. And what that will do is it will create a window to render graphics. And I've already done that. So right here it is. <laughs> Here's one I made earlier. Um, so yeah, this is uh, uh, something that sh will, will show graphics. And what I can do now is I can now create graphics. I'm going to move this over here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to put another box on screen. It's going to call gem head. And then I'm going to say if I wanted to put a cube on the screen, I would literally type the word cube. And well, nothing's sort of happening. That's because I need to connect them up. Again, this is like a mind map, everything's connected. So I click on, there's a little thing that's called an outlet at the bottom of this object. I click on it and I drag an actual line to wherever I want to connect it to. So I'm going to drag that and connect it to here. Ta da! <clears throat> and now we've got ourselves a cube. And we can do various things with this cube. Um, I can. So if you think of any other functions that you might want to do, every any other way you want, want to tr what any other way you might want to transform the object. So you might want to move it, you might want to spin it around, you might want to make it bigger or smaller. We can do that. So I've I've been doing this one for years, so I can I know all of these off by heart. <laughs> so forgive me for like kind of skipping a lot of things. So I know I can do rotate if I can spell rotate, rotate x y z, and now I can disconnect this line and then put it in between the cube and gem head and by default it's doing nothing but these little inlets here one two and three each one of those is like a different axis so the first one corresponds to x the second one y and the last one z so um now if i like send a number send a value to that so i do that here you see i've got a little thing that has a number and I click on it, and I'm going to make it rotate on the, let's say the, mm, yeah, let's say the y-axis. And now I can click on this. And as I click and drag on it, it starts to spin. So I'm, I'm moving my mouse up and down, and it's moving, spinning around, measuring it in degrees. And that's great. So now I can uh, you know, interact with this uh, cube. And if I wanted to, I could put another number as well and have it so that, it's going to spin on the Z axis. See, now it's on the Z, spinning on the Y, and so on. But this is, we're working with computers here, right? We, we oh, actually, there's one other thing I'll show. So right now we've got a cube. What about if I wanted to have a sphere? Um, let's type in the word sphere. And it's a very low resolution sphere now. Look, it's a circle. But what about, let's try dog. <laughs> We don't have dogs. Uh, so when you, whenever you type a function that doesn't exist, you can see it's got all the dotted red lines around it. So yeah, that's not great. But let's put cube back in for now. Um, you can create a dog object if you wanted to, but not going to do that today. But yeah, so now that we're, because we're open with computers, we want to automate a lot of the things. So imagine if I'm performing and I want to have this spinning around. Well, I can't just, you yeah. know, click on it and drag it at all for the for all like 20 minutes of performance that would just take forever so what i can do instead is i can use um yeah i can just basically create a counter which will increment numbers which will count from zero to infinity and then i can send that value into one of the different rotations so if i um and i'm going to again skip over a few things um but so i'm going to create a toggle and i'm going to create what's called a metronome and it's going to measure in, in thousands of milliseconds. So I'm going to say every 1,100, sorry, every 100 milliseconds, I'm going to take a number and I'm going to add one to it. So let's say by default, it gives you the number zero. So I'm going to take the number zero, add one, and then send that back to itself. And the output of that, when I turn this little switch on, is you see, it's counting up now. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, it's you know, every every 100 milliseconds is incrementing the number. So now I can send this to here, and it's spinning automatically. Yay. And again, I can send it to the Z axis as well. And for fun, let's put it on the X as well. So now we've got it spinning on every axis, this cube, forever and ever and ever, until I turn off the toggle, and then it stops. But I can turn it back on. So don't worry about that. So yeah, this is, <laughs> again, an incredibly quick look at what I'm doing when I'm performing. So you can imagine that um, 
when uh, I'm performing, and so you, in this screenshot here, you can see just behind all of these uh, these little objects. That's me. That's me typing that all live in front of people. This person right here. I'm typing it right in front of everyone. Um, and you can see it's it's a complete mess, but you know it's it's a performance. People are looking, <laughs> yeah, infinite loop. You're right. I've created an infinite loop. That's how that counter works. So um, I I'm making all of this live in front of people, and they're seeing it build up. And that's partly the joy of it is seeing um, that uh, the computer or the screen will kind of uh, start off uh, blank, and then it will build up. Sorry, I need to. Uh, close a program now because the cube won't go away so let's not save it there we go so yeah it, the, the joy is basically being able to see something start from zero and then build up over time and then you're gonna go you can just kind of watch it and it's like oh wow and it it kind of demystifies what computing is for a lot of people or at least for me definitely because so many times when we're looking at when we're using computers it's like yeah, how does it work and what's behind the black box and everything and at least with this sort of thing live coding or, and even what we're doing here on this course you know we're learning that okay humans made this humans uh, know how all of this works and there are there are manuals there are way to, ways to understand it so um i'll i'm gonna start wrapping up in a second and but to before that so i showed you pure data which is the, the software that i use for visuals you might Again, I don't know everyone's background. I know there's quite a few, a lot of people on this boot camp. But if you are into your visuals, maybe you've heard of like something like Max MSP before. But then there's other live coding languages. Oh, and I should note that pretty much all of the live coding languages, like at least 90% of the ones that I've come across, are all open source and they're all free. So some of them work in the browser, some of them you have to install. But you know, there's there's plenty out there for you to try. And so for visuals, if you wanted to try learning some visuals, um, there's a few, oops. Yeah, there's a, there's a few you can try. So this is a screenshot, I'll just mute it. <laughs> we don't need to have the audio on. Um, this is just like a screenshot of a visual software called Hydra. And this one looks a bit more like kind of organic. So um, this one is sort of akin to JavaScript, but not quite. You know, it's a custom programming language, but it's still amazing. I think you can make some really like um, nice shapes from it. And this is a sort of a something else I made in pure data. So this is one I made earlier. And again, you can see the objects that I, are being used to create it all. And then the output is what you see here. And then, um, then there's also this other programming language which I've used a lot called Improvis. And Improvis, uh, well, yeah, you see there's lots of cubes on screen. <laughs> I didn't write this piece of code. Someone else far smarter than me wrote this, but you know, um, the code's there should you want to try it. And yeah, so like, you know, you've got plenty of options for if you want to learn how to do the music or the visual side of things. And so I'm going to stop there, actually. And yeah, hopefully that's just kind of showed you a little bit of like the kind of stuff you can do with programming um, that yeah, being weird for a career. Again, I love that, Jess, when you said that. But yeah, and you know, how, this is how I am um, using code to uh, make art. And as as I hopefully showed as well, like it's it's it, there, there are audiences for this. Like I work within the gallery sector and the creative sector in the UK and um, yeah, there I've exhibited far and wide. I've traveled the world doing this kind of stuff. So yeah, there is an audience for it. And sometimes it's just, I just like making nice colors, really. <laughs> sometimes it is just me going, that's a pretty color. So yeah, um, I'll say thank you. And this is all the places you can find me at if you want to try and find me. I'm usually just Hello Cat Food on pretty much every website. I don't think anyone else has a username hello cat food but if you do want to um ask more especially if you want to find out more about like some of this live coding all of the links are there uh, i do have some of my code upon github but you know it's, it's probably terrible code so yeah um i guess i'll say yeah thank you again and if you could have jess back and we'll take some questions 
Well, I can't hear you, Jess. Jess, I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there you go. You know what? I was making a point about how you don't have to be that good oh, at computers. Okay. To, I'm sorry, to Jess, I, I still can't hear you. I think it's because, like, remember the, the thing you were talking about in, 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 uh, I don't, oh, no, you know why? It's because I, it's because I had the whole system muted. It's not your fault. It was my fault. Sorry, Jess. Come back, Jess. I'm back. <laughs> I, I turned down my volume, you see. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sometimes it, it's, yeah. Oh, okay. I had been saying, Oh, this proves my point. You don't have to be great at everything to get to do cool things with computers. <laughs> um, and it's nice to have that that just continually reinforce that yeah. although they give us the internet and art and communication, that computers at the end of the day were still a mistake. Yeah, sometimes you've just got to make sure it's switched on. Like, when you work on computers, just change it. Turn it on and off, restart yeah, it. Yeah. And sometimes you just need to hold up a device, look deeply into its soul, and then release it into the canal. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, thank you, for Jess, for, let, for letting me talk. Uh, well, now we're going to do some exciting things because people had really, really hyped questions. So, so for oh, okay. me, what's it like being an internationally renowned man of mystery who gets to travel the world getting weird? It's it's very stressful, I imagine, very difficult. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, it's, it, so this is the thing. It's I, I enjoy it a lot because, you know, it's it's – just like when your programming is a creative thing, right? You programming is something that you're you're doing, whether that's you know working for a company doing like database stuff or whatever, or front end dev, or what I'm doing. It's all creative, so I love that about it. But you know, it's still there. It's it's got particular audiences. Like even though I've uh, so you know, it's famous in a very particular, very niche way. <laughs> Like, I've, I've never been stopped on the street. Let, let me, let, I'll just say that. I've never been stopped on the street. So, folks watching today, if you see Antonio on the street, definitely stop him. Ah! Okay. Right. Uh, we've got a really good question with Tanya. So, when you were first showing us some of the glitched visuals, Kanye was like, oh, wow. How did this kind of art first get, where is this coming from? How did this gain traction? Oh, man. So, of course, like, I, I'm, I'm uh, still kind of a young person. Well, not young. I'm 36 and... Uh, I mentioned that because, of course, there have been people before me making computer graphics. So, like, I'm not going to I'm not going to completely like erase all of that history of computing and computing art. But like for me, it started like I started getting into this around 2009. Um, there was a, this there's this art form called glitch art, which is you know making art from errors uh, that tends to look a bit like you know like this. Um, so you know, that kind of, that's kind of like glitch art. And I started coming across the glitch art community around 2009. And from that, like they had a few events. Uh, this was in Chicago, um, 2010. And so just meeting people there as well who like to experiment. And a part of it is, is just um, having a system and just taking it apart and seeing how it works and seeing what else it can do that might not have been intended. So, you know, making art by like, hacking a or like modifying a system it's beyond what it was pro made to do but yeah so that that's sort of at least um how i got into it and then how it gained traction i guess within the popular media internet <laughs> like a lot of things well, i've heard of that internet thing yeah yes i think it might catch on but um <laughs> so yeah a lot of it is just like yeah people we make like lots of these smaller uh, niche communities just sharing their their techniques and things with each other and then suddenly you find yourself like being covered by like vice or like there's a youtube video or someone does something and then that that then other people get interested and before you know it, you've got like communities of people again still niche-ish communities but like they're, they're they're global communities and yeah now i'm here if you get weird on the internet they will come Basically, yeah. There's, the good thing about the internet is there's a community for everything, for better or worse, but <laughs> there's a community for everything. So if you've got like this weird art form that you like, there's probably a space for it somewhere. There's probably someone, a space that will support you in some way. And luckily, I found that myself with Glitch Art, Algorithm, and everything else. There's probably other weirdos waiting for you on the internet. <laughs> Yes, there are. That sounds much That's more menacing than that was in my head, it wasn't was. it? It was. 
<laughs> uh, you'd be like, well, you just go out and follow your dreams and you'll run into the. So uh, we had somebody say, oh, hey, wait, back when you were looking at the, the algorithm stuff, is the music also code generated for the algorithm? Yeah. It what? Is. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, it depends on the language that you're using. So, like, I use this programming for my music, I use this programming language called Tidal Cycles. And you're basically defining patterns. So, you know, like you're saying every X seconds play a bass drum or every X seconds play a bass sample or guitar sample or whatever. And you're then defining patterns which might say, okay, play it four times in this second, but every 12, 20 seconds, 20 cycles or play it this many times or slow it down and so on. So you can create these like complex algorithms to have something very simple become a bit more complex, still musical, but you know, complex. So instead of give me a cube, give me yeah. a beat and instead yeah. of rotate it, go, chun, chun, chun. I, I'm, I'm bad. Uh, yeah. Is somebody saying, <laughs> Hey, can you make art in any programming language? Um, Ooh, That's a philosophical so, yeah. question, isn't that? <laughs> like, what is the nature of art and what are the limits yeah. of programming languages, Mr. Roberts? Yeah, I think you can, like, because even, okay, even what you're learning right now of HTML and CSS, um, back in the day, I saw lots of people making art using just tables, like <laughs> filling in backgrounds. Don't you tables. tell don't them do to do that. tables. Oh, no, sorry, we're not. Uh, uh, no. For, for, for the learners who are just getting started, tables were... Um, um, I keep telling you that all elements in HTML are rectangles. These were explicit like rectangles made of frames and they were they were bad. They've fallen out of favor. Please don't do them. I'll don't be sad. It. Yeah, it was all I, I I like to think of it as like, you know, like in Excel where you've got the cells. <laughs> And imagine that's a web page and wherever you want stuff you gotta put in, you're basically putting it in a cell. And so when you wanted something that was colorful, you put the background on the cell. It was a terrible time of the year, isn't it? But it was a creative time. <laughs> well, um, but then, do you want another even, philosophical question? Oh, sorry. Oh, let me just, um, just one more answer to that question as well. But, Eve, but more recently, people have been doing a lot with CSS animations. So you can animate, like you can have gradient backgrounds, you can have things, you know, moving in certain ways so if you've got like I, I even saw someone do like make pixel art using css basically like you know applying a filter to an existing photo um, and making any photo into a pixel art photo so basically if there's a programming language it can probably be used to make art some of it will be a bit of a hack but most of them but there are but like look hopefully what i've shown is that there are lots and lots of spe specialist programming languages that work on the internet that can use be used just for making art and really at the end of the day what is a hack but art yeah. i've got another philosophical art question are you excited oh go for it yeah Mr. Robert, what other art forms can be explored via programming? <laughs> oh, all, all of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't, all, yeah. There's, there's so many others. So what all of So, um, for example, I, I've worked with um, live performers, like as in dancers, on stage using programming. Uh, that's like, of course, you can use motion tracking and have uh, programming. Of course, that yeah, way. we've yeah. all so, of used course, motion all tracking. But yeah, you, you can have, so you can do that. You can work with live performers. I've seen people work with singers using uh, programming, uh, you know, it, collaborating one and both at the same time. There's stuff you can do with, um, and I guess it's like, any output can be programmed. So I've, I've even seen someone um, use programming to make 3D printing stuff. Like they they will actually, uh, so yeah, they'll, they'll make something uh, using programming like in Blender or like use programming to make a abstract shape and then 3D print that. So oh. a, yeah, exactly. So it's like programming really is like a method, I guess, to make the things that you want. So, you know, the images that I've shown you here, they could easily be printed or made into any other, well, not easily, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a method with which you can then take it onto something else to make it into a physical object or whatever else. So we're going to go with the answer, all of them. So yeah. you can get <laughs> as weird as you like. And if you can find an art form that can't be explored via programming, you should go ahead and complain to... Antonio Roberts. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Directly to be like, 
I tried to make art using Pearl and it disappointed. Uh, uh, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> per pearls the poetry of of programming it's it's lovely and flexible um when you were look how look how inspiring you are when you were showing us your pure data stuff tanya was like what what are the what what do i need to do this do i do, do i need a computer do i need a what are my minimum system requirements to get weird like you're getting yeah weird? so um in the past i've done workshops like in glitch art uh you know making this kind of stuff and i've done that using a, a raspberry pi yeah like, oh so, so just a little bitty baby computer yeah 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 so raspberry micro pi computers is, the real is, world word is isn't it it's not a baby computer yeah, yeah. So, uh, this is this is like this is some called a raspberry pi it costs like uh, about 30 pounds or i guess the equivalent in dollars or whatever currency and it's about as powerful as a computer that was back in like the early 2000s uh or yeah and it, it, yeah, it's, it's a good thing you can use sorry jess you're gonna say something no, no, I was just um, confronting my own age and mortality and the speed of the world. I have yeah. nothing to say. It's just me looking directly <laughs> into my own death. Yeah, because I remember actually buying a computer um, in 2004 for like a thousand pounds. And it was like this really noisy beast and it was slow. And now it's it's been miniaturized into something which costs not even one percent of that so yeah it's i'm confronting that as well <laughs> <laughs> I feel like no um fabio saying hey can you sell your art on an nft marketplace um again i'm gonna let you go because you, yeah. you don't need my opinion same yeah. same uh, little uh, yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh, i personally i don't really do stuff with nfts um for various reasons which i don't want to get into but um i'll get I, into them yeah but i um again it's like you can if this is an image like i know nfts is about selling digital artifacts so if it can be made digitally you can put it on an nft marketplace similarly you can sell it the normal way as well like i um like this video the one with the illegible text um i recently sold that to a government art collection so the uk government owns this artwork now uh, so, it's a video and so, they, they didn't even want it as an nft they were just like we love yeah, you we'd like, love to give you money and fame and recognition and do, do they send you like a like a medal do they send a swan to your house what's the uk government <laughs> art buying process oh it, i have to tell a little story uh, it was very funny because like of course with artists who make like physical sculptures and everything and when you get into like the, the, the more fine art world you you'll have like particular companies who deal with uh, delivery and transport of artists because of course you don't want it being uh, um, damaged in transit so this video is is an mp4 file and i remember they sent me an email saying okay we've put you in touch with the courier company who will arrange delivery of the artwork and i was like it's an mp4 um i can i can put it on a usb stick but i can also just pull it on dropbox <laughs> and so you know it, and that's the process i was like you, you don't have to send a, a van to pick up this usb stick i will put it in the post but yeah you know it's like um it is a, it's an artwork it's a, it's a thing that exists and so again it, if you want to sell it you can sell it on any marketplace physical marketplace or digital marketplace yeah so you can get weird with money as well up to and including till the cops show up at your door yeah <laughs> uh mad store is like hey do you use processing and i'm not sure yeah Ooh. so processing um for those that don't know um processing is kind of like uh oh how am gonna it's, it's a programming language for um creative coding i guess it's like a lot, of, a lot of what I showed you today, similar things could be done using processing. It's open source. It just turned 20, actually, the programming language. It can be used as a JavaScript library, so you don't have to use it on the desktop. And yeah, it's 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 very well documented, and there's an amazing community and uh, behind it. And if you're especially if you're interested, there's this one YouTube channel, The Coding Train, uh, and the, the guy's very lovely and um, talks about it very a lot so but no i don't use processing or processing and I'm, I'm british i say processing <laughs> i don't use processing not for any particular reason it's just not the language that i've used like it's an amazing language um i just haven't used it but i highly recommend it to anyone starting out because lots of documentation lots of examples 
and you can do a lot of great things with it. Cool. So processing, not your cup of tea, but a cup of tea that someone else might want to try. So we've got a yeah. ton of other stuff. Tanya's saying, oh, wait, hey, would an Arduino work instead of a Raspberry Pi? Um, so um, just, just to explain again for everyone else. So this um, Raspberry Pi is basically like having a really small Linux computer. So like if you were to plug this in, it's got a little HDMI port. If you were to plug this into a TV or screen, you would see basically like you know, your normal sort of desktop experience. Whereas an Arduino is a microcontroller, which it's like, I don't know, it's just like a circuit board, a programmable circuit board. You're not going to really be able to see a GUI um, or graphical user interface. So um, as we're- One's it more like a baby do. computer, one's more like a series of switches. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So- I know I've seen people use Arduinos, especially like when they're doing sort of like robotic stuff, because you don't want all the baggage that comes with like an operating system. You just literally want, here's a circuit board, and you want it to send the message on or off to a series of lights. So um, as we are everything, it depends what it is you want to make. Um, but I personally, I use this because it's basically like a, like Jess said, a baby computer. And I already know, I, mean, I, I use Linux, by the way, as my operating system. And so using this which runs linux is just familiar to me so i use this we've got another look tanya is tanya is just they're, <laughs> they're they're in all of these lessons and they're always asking good questions and cool. hey have you tried doing any machine learning and i'm going to do a follow-up question of that and be like hey have you done any deep dream stuff or can you tell the learners what deep dream is oh um i don't know if i can explain deep dream very well i'll try because um, so I haven't done have any you ever had learning. a nightmare? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I haven't done any machine learning with glitch art. Uh, reasons being, I just don't know why I do with it. Like there's, uh, there's, uh, yeah, I, I have no reason to do that in any of my artworks. Probably some of the artists have, but again, not the, not that I've seen in my travels. And yeah, with a deep dream sort of stuff. So I guess like with machine learning. Um, the, and like AI, kind of like when you want when you want an artificial intelligence to recognize an image, like so. I realize it's got very dark in my room, so I, I was going to try and hold <laughs> something up, but there's no point. You won't be able to see it. So, like, say you've got like a, an, an apple or whatever, and you want the computer to be able to recognize pictures of apples. You have to show the computer or the AI millions of images of apples and also not apples, so it's able to dis to distinguish like what what that might what it what one doesn't look like as well as what what does look like it and so in its like behind the scenes kind of thing as it's recognizing images the way that it look the ways that you'll see images look like these very gloopy image like imagine that you've got all of the millions of images combined into one and morphing in and out of each other that's kind of like what deep dream looks like it looks like the amalgamation imagine just putting everything in its primordial ooze and it's just being stirred around. And then eventually, if you tell the computer you want a picture of an apple, it'll get that primordial ooze that looks all gloopy and then turn it into a picture of an apple. But what you see in the deep dream stuff is that ooze. <laughs> is that, how would you describe it? Or is, is it? Um, I, well, no, I'm just loving it because of course you've got the loveliest voice in the world. And as your room becomes increasingly dark, it's, it's more and more of a deep dream vibe, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so machine learning is exactly like you've described. So you say, hey, computer, or hey, series of computational processes. I want to teach you about what it's like to be a puppy. I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of a puppy. And then deep dream is when you say, hey, give me, give me a picture of a puppy. And it says, cool. I've melted all of your nightmares about puppies together and studded it with a kaleidoscope of eyes. Deep Dream loves to add eyes, where it's like, hi, would you like an icy, cold, neon technicolor nightmare Yeah. with extra eyes? <laughs> we've got a really specific question. And, you know, I can't even. We've got two really, really good ones. And one. Okay. Like, oh, gosh, we've got three. Oh, drat. Oh, I'm not boy. drat. But, like, I keep getting my numbers wrong just because they're good at this. I said, like, hey, do you like, can you, are there any, is there any kind of computational art that's specifically designed around different kinds of access or accessibility? Hey, there was a show about this last Ooh. year, wasn't there? Um, hmm. Is there any art? 
what was the show that you saw, Jess? Actually, wasn't there something at Bomb around? Uh, yes, there was. radically accessible video game art. Yeah. So, um, is there any? Oh, so, yeah. Is, is, is there any of this art dedicated to uh, directed to accessibility? Um, yes, there is. So, of course, like um, I, I'd say I'm an able-bodied person. So I know that, like, to to my discredit, sometimes I haven't thought about this. But um, luckily, I work with a company often called Birmingham Open Media, or their website is bomb.org.uk. That's b-o-m.org.uk. Shout out. But um, and they did an exhibition. Two years ago now, it wasn't last year because remember last year Jess was was cancelled last year. So yeah, oh gosh, of course the whole year yeah, was cancelled. They were like, yeah, "Hi, yeah, yeah. good morning. I hope you enjoyed the winter. Please go home." <laughs> so yeah, two years ago there was this um, exhibition at this gallery which looked at accessibility uh, in and radical gaming, as Jess was saying, and yeah, you know, exploring one the different methods of inputs for computer computer controllers because. I don't know about you, like I, I love playing, for example, The Legend of Zelda, um, Arch um, Breath of the Wild. Great game. Was that, you know what, I'm very old. I was going to be like, oh, is that the one that came out a couple of years ago? And like everything yeah, was yeah. a couple of years ago when you're my yeah. age. Yeah. I'd be yeah. like, oh, you remember the other year? And I mean 1997. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this, this one came out, I think, five years ago now. But yeah, but like the the, the control system, it's like you, you, you're having to press a series of complex key presses all at the same time and i'm like this would not be accessible to like even even just um motor um differences uh sorry the words are escaping me but e even just not being able to press the key presses quickly enough so birmingham media did an exhibition about this um and yeah so that that's a really good one to look at and i know that um the topic of accessibility has come up a lot more um in in re like at least within the communities that I work with in um, in the digital art world, because um, yeah, last year especially when we were all working online, suddenly you know we're having to think about accessibility for ourselves, but also for those who are differently able because. That we're all at home and and we might not have access to the technology that we need. So yeah, there are there are there, I sadly I can't point to, apart from that one example which Jess brought up. Um, I can't think of any others specifically right now, but uh, there will be more. Um, Remember what question. happens when you ask a really good question and we don't have an example and we can't think of it. So you've already done the the first thing you can do is you can ask someone else. You could look it up. Yeah. Or. Um, of course, you're busy, but you could make you could get weird, couldn't you? You could make your own radically accessible, extremely weird art. Yes. Um, and we've got Phil saying, "Hey, hey, hey! Oh, heck, where'd you go, Phil?" I was saying, "Hey, how could how could an environmental organization, for example, or how could one more generally get your digital art into museums? How does digital art get into a museum?" Um. Oh boy, <laughs> that that's a, that's a, that's a big topic because um. Yeah, getting your artwork into museums. Um, I guess it's like any any um, sort of art. You just show up at the museum and you knock on the door yeah, and yeah. you say, "Hey, I've printed out my CV and I'm wearing a suit. Here, 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 have yeah. an art." <laughs> exactly, have one art. No, um, I guess when it comes to like you know wanting to work with a gallery, you've got to think who it is you want to work with. Uh, because there's definitely, as I was saying earlier, like there's communities for everything. And so there will be definitely some galleries, some organizations better suited to certain types of art, including environmental art. Um, so <clears throat> it's first knowing which ones to approach, um, which of course requires some re research. I'm not sure where you're based, but, you know, check what else, what's there um, in, in, your, in, your, in, in your thing. And then a lot of it's just like getting a project idea together and, I, like, I, I do a lot of um, project proposal writing and um, things like that. And even even looking at project proposals from other people. And I guess like most of the time, you just want to know a few things. Uh, what is it that like, so if, if you're ever writing a project proposal for like funding or to, to make something happen, you usually just need to make sure you've told them what it is you want to do, uh, when you want to do it, uh, who you want to do it with, like what, what organizations, what artists you want to bring in, and how much money it's going to cost. Like, if you can get those four things, I'll put this up, then you, you're on, you're on no a good No paperwork way. at all. No, you just show <laughs> yeah. up and you're like, sup, it's me. 
here's yeah. what I want to do. Here's what, there's no forms. There's definitely no grant writing. I, I, oh, no, I there's fear. There's a lot of forms. There's a lot of grant writing. I, I fear the but answer it's... is that there's going to be a lot of research to do, that there's a whole yeah. sort of field around this. But I guess just to summarize well, it's just, you know, you've got to have a project plan and to be able to articulate it well. And then once you've approached the gallery or the institution, which, you know, you feel would be very well, very um, receptive of it, then hopefully I'll be like, OK, I can understand this and I know how it would work. Maybe we don't have schedule. We don't have time on our schedule right now, but maybe like in a year we can we can make this happen. Or like you know, let's actually start the conversation now. But uh, yeah, it's it's sadly like even my own art career, it's a lot of just like getting to know people, um, and then opportunities often just arrive. Like even this opportunity right now with Jess, like you know, it's like people you know will ask you to be involved in things, and that it just happens randomly sometimes so trust in serendipitous fate but also research and hustle we're yes. going to ask two more questions one of which is an Ooh. opinion question and Ooh. i'm going to get to pronounce an artist's name wrong um, and the last one is a really good outro question it's like hey where, where can i make friends and i think these are both very good questions <clears throat> antonio what do you think about the edmund de bellamy portrait I have absolutely no idea who that is. Sorry, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I I could Google that right now. Um, or duck duck go. It. We could do what's in your oh, yeah, heart. Sorry. Actually, it's, yeah. No. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a verb. Sorry, uh, I have to Google go. Yeah. <laughs> and and I I'm I'm agnostic. I'm I'm. Do you know what? I'm elderly enough where deep in my heart I'm trying to bring web search back. Um, ah, I think I know what it. I think I know. Um, yeah. Can you call, can so, you put the the link to the the image in where your thank you is, or is that? So I I've just basically googled it. Uh, like Dr. Go did. I've just put it into a search engine. <laughs> Web searched it, and it just came up with a Wikipedia article. Um, and essentially, it seems like it is one of those uh, machine learning um, AI artworks, and um, I, again, I, I've seen similar things. So imagine, for example, uh, I'm trying to think of the artist now. Um, I can't remember who it is. Let's say Picasso. I'm just going to say Picasso because that's all I can think of right now. So um, imagine you've, yeah, there you go. Um, and I'm, I'm just going, I'm reading this as as, as much as you are. Um, oh, Belle and me. Belle and uh... Okay, go on, go on, go on. You, you, you've got something you can say. Um, no, it's it's yeah. a pun. It's it's a pun. I'm I'm just where I was okay. like, oh, what a lovely name. I've never heard that, but <clears throat> yeah. So so um, imagine then. So like, say, say you've got an artist um, uh, who's uh, you know, deceased, and they've got lots of paintings, and you want to create. You want an AI to create a painting in their style. So what again? This is what you do. You kind of study the painting or their paintings. You gain. Uh, lots of millions of images of it, get all the different data points, make uh, AIs and algorithms to analyze their painting style, the colors they've used. And then you say to the AI, okay, create one artwork, please, in the style of that artist. And that's what they do. And I've seen some art, I've seen this kind of thing happen with other artists in the past. And again, the name escapes me very suddenly. But um, and, you know, they, they say, oh, that was it. Was, it was a Rembrandt. So it's like, Rem here is a new Rembrandt painting, even though he's been dead for a bajillion years. And it's like, well, no, it's not a new one by him. It's one in the style of him by analyzing his artwork. And people do that anyway and so on. And, you know, they usually sell for lots of money. So, like, the Edmund de Bellamy one sold um, for $432,000 because... Yeah, you know, whatever. Um, and personally, I, I don't know. I, I, I see like the the um, the hype around it, and I, I see the desire technology and see like what is it that you can use? What what can technology do? But I know that sometimes this whole get this when you get into that sort of like AI stuff, it goes into the arguments of like, well, we can just have computers make art. We don't need DJs. We don't need musicians or artists. We can just have them make it. And it's like, that's a very reductive way of looking at it. Like, you know, computers taking over. Humans are always still needed for, for things. And I don't for think- For batteries, we've seen the matrix. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a new one. <laughs> but yeah, so- um, 
Yeah, so I think that that's what it is. Like, so again, I don't know about particular artwork, but I've seen like the sort of AI stuff, and I think it's interesting. I don't think it's like going to take over artists, <laughs> and I think it's yeah, um, it, as an exploration, as an experiment, it's cool. But uh, for me, it it doesn't like I'm not exploring that. Doesn't, cool. Doesn't me. We've got one more question, and I'm really okay. excited by this. And this this seems like a really solid question to go, Antonio. Because we're all friends now. Tanya's like, Antonio, yay, my buddy. Where should I go and hang out with art weirdos on the internet? <laughs> oh, man. Or where uh, could I go and hang out yeah, with digital art yes. weirdos on the internet? So um, th this is obviously old internet now, but there, I'm going to put this in the ch uh, chat, Jess, yeah. so if you, you want to like copy paste it. But where I started with my glitch art journey was this festival called gli.tc slash h or glitch. And this is a festival that happened in Chicago mostly. And um, so that, even though there isn't like necessarily like a, a um, forum there or anything, but hopefully, if you're into this kind of like um, glitch art stuff, that will point you in di direction of like other people doing similar stuff. Like you'll be able to go, oh yeah, there's this artist, and they they hang out here. So you know, check out glitch, and then also just look at glitch art communities. Like there are various um, discords and tumblers, and I don't use Facebook anymore, but you know, there's lots of these sorts of groups on there. Um, with the live coding stuff and Algorave. So um, to check if there's one in your area. Uh, oh, good. We had a question about that as well. Somebody was yeah. asking, how do we get to go to a beat boot party? Like, do I do that? <laughs> um, so um, algorave.com will show, like, lots of upcoming algorithms. Like, it is mostly just a listing site. Um, and it will show ones that are happening all over the world. We, used, we, we do sometimes do, um, uh, like, live streams, uh, like, because the algorithm community is very global, um, we often like have um, live streams, which sometimes last a week. Like you have, yeah, you have performances going on like twenty four hours a day. Because uh, you know it's like okay, the UK people have start finished. Let's have people in oh. Colombia go, and then it's like okay, they finished. Let's have people in Tokyo go, and then, and so on. So you have that. So if you want to find out about the live streams, you can go to this thing called Euler Room. Um, and Euler Room is a terrible pun, and if you get it, then you're great. I didn't get it, um, but if you know of boy, you ever heard of Boiler Room? Yeah. Um, yeah, and Euler, I think it's like a, oh, I don't know, it's a mathematical function of some sort. And so instead of Boiler Room, you have Euler Room. See, I, I did not. I'm be like, oh, so, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I, I still don't get it. Well. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I don't particularly even like. I, I understand that it exists, that pun, but I don't really get it. So <laughs> anyway, so um, Void Room is where you can see lots of live streams, and then if you wanted to learn more about, like, this will have links to other Discord communities for particular programming languages and like uh, mailing lists and so on. So if you want to learn um, generally about the practice of live coding, top lap org um will like has like a calendar and it has like blog posts from particular artists and everything and that you know is is um and it'll it'll, it'll probably point you to forums that i'm part of as well um so just go to those places and you can you can like there's there's, there's so many others of course steve uh, is asking see, i don't oh, even know what a, a do you mean like an aurelian a, a... Uh, yeah, yeah, Steve. That's exactly what it is. That that yeah, thing that yeah, we both totally. know. Yeah, oh. we understand that. Yeah, let's throw our head back. Let's throw our heads back and laugh because that was probably very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just don't uh, know what it no, is. <laughs> no, no. Um, you must forgive us. I'm a professional goofus, and Antonio is just pretending not to know to make sure I don't feel bad. He's, he's no, I, I literally don't know. Um, I come on, you see my artwork. I mean. <laughs> Make usually animated gifs and uh, glitches, so you know, like Oilers, yeah, funny. <laughs> sorry, so sorry to that person who asked the question. We're going to go ahead and let you go before you are fully subsumed into the gloom. That's true. Um, yeah. On the way out, w just to, to get to say your cool online handle one more time, where can people find you on the internet if they want to hang out? So um, I'm pretty much on every website as hello cat food so but my website's hellocatfood.com and uh otherwise yeah hello cat food on every other um site 
in the world. On the well. world. So you yeah. heard that Antonio is available on every single website you'll ever encounter. Um, <laughs> 24 hours a day, seven days uh, a week, nonstop Antonio. And and just yeah. on our way out, what was, what, you mentioned there was the best city in the UK. What was that again? Ooh. Ooh. Birmingham? Birmingham. I, I, I think it was Birmingham, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah, it's yeah. Cool. I like it. It's great. You should move. Everyone should move here. Um, but like, cool. also keep keep the rents down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's getting expensive. But it's cool. <laughs> Fabulous. So you all have been an absolutely fantastic audience, Antonio. As always, brilliant and far too cool to grace my screen. But here you are, and thank you for your charity. Brilliant. Thanks cool. very much, Jess. Have a good For one. those of you who are part of the boot camp, I'll see you on Monday or Tuesday for lessons. And we're going to be coming back next Wednesday. And we're going to be a couple hours earlier than this one. Um, and we're going to be talking to a UX researcher about, hey, what does it mean to make your websites or to make your properties friendly for users? How can you make the web more humane? Um, thank you all so much. And we'll see you next week. Bye, my loves. <laughs>